Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Lara Villamot. I am the head of outreach and community experience at the Framingham Public Library. We are so thrilled that tonight's event is all about tea, Camellia Sinesis Demystified with Sue Ann Scalise from Mem Tea. Um, Mem Tea is a local Boston tea company. In 1999, fine loose tea was scarce and a small but passionate group was forming to spread the word. At the same time, there was a movement among chefs and restaurant people to source ingredients with integrity. So it seemed a natural fit to introduce tea to the crowd. Mark Eli Moradian, am I saying that right, Sue Ann? Moradian. Moradian, excuse me, M-E-M -E for short, created yeah. Mem Tea and began sourcing, importing, and distributing tea to the food service and hospitality interests, collect, conducting thousands of tastings and trainings for cafes, restaurants, hotels, and more. Uh, today, they provide extensive tea programs to over 100 cafes, 800 cafes, restaurants, and other businesses around New England and the U.S., and now here at the library for us tonight. Um, they also run their own tea shop and training center, and their reps do frequent check-ins to make sure their customers enjoy the perfect cup of tea. Um, they also have the best job in the world and get to spend several hours on Tuesday nights at their warehouse tasting tea after tea after tea to make sure they have the best teas on hand. Um, tonight, we are thrilled to have uh, Sue Ann Scalise join us. She's the Director of Education from MEM. They'll guide us through understanding tea. If you picked a take and make kit up, you have the flavors in front of you. If you weren't able to register for a kit, we still encourage you to have a cup of tea on hand to enjoy during this presentation. A um, few quick announcements before we get started. As you've heard the lady probably tell you, this lecture is being recorded, so if you weren't able to make it tonight, or if you know friends who weren't able to make it tonight, do point them in the direction of our YouTube channel so they can take a look and see what they missed. Um, at the end, we'll have a question and answer period, and if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to pop those in the chat, and I will read them out loud to Sue Ann. And I'll also be throwing an evaluation form at the beginning and the end of the presentation into our chat box. After it's over, please feel free to click the link, share your thoughts, what you thought about the library's program. And um, please do make sure that you wait until the event is over to fill out the form, just because it's going to redirect you to a brand new page. And we want you to make sure that you stay and see the entirety of the presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Sue Ann. Welcome. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I thought I was going to have to give you uh, an introduction to MEMT, but Lara has done an excellent job um, explaining our company. Um, our shop, I'm in our, I'm in our retail store in Davis Square in the back room where we used to have live events and tastings, and we haven't really been able to do that since the pandemic began. So, um, you know, this has kind of become um, my recording studio <laughs> so where we, we've been shooting some videos for some of our wholesale clients, you know, instructional videos and, and also doing, doing the Zoom classes. So um, it was really hard for, uh, for me to choose uh, teas for us to taste tonight because we have over 150 teas here in the store, um, but I needed to select teas that we produce in tea bags, um, which then we only have 16 to choose from. And even then it was hard to narrow it down uh, to four. But um, so I, I chose sort of by my, some of my favorites and, and also by sales, some of the most popular teas that we have. Um, so we have two green teas that we're gonna taste, a black tea and an herbal tea. But I just wanted to um, talk about, since we've already talked about uh, Mem Tea, um, I was wondering if uh, maybe what we should do is um, if you all have a packet, if you don't have a packet, um, just put some water on and we're gonna steep some tea and then uh, get, while it's steeping, I'm gonna just show you a few pictures so that we can uh, sort of learn something uh, while the tea is steeping. So, so there's a menu included in the packet if you have it and we're just gonna be going from the top down. So we're gonna be starting with the Jasmine Pearl uh, green tea. So if you can locate your Jasmine Pearl tea bag and you'll notice on the back of the package, um, it has a temperature and time. So we don't, we don't need to know how much tea volume wise to put in because it's been pre-measured. 
but I am going to just open it up and um, put it in. I'm using glass just so that you can see um, see what's happening here with the tea. So as uh, as you may know notice that the water temperature says 185 degrees. So if you all have a kettle on the stove and it boiled or it whistled, that means that your water temperature is around over 200 degrees. Boiling is 212 and it off the boil, if it's been sitting for a few minutes, it might be around 200 degrees. So what I've got boiling boiled water here. So this is probably about 200 degrees. So if I wanna reduce that temperature to 185, one trick that we tell all of our uh, you know, cafes and restaurants, because they only have one water source as well, and it's usually hotter than 185, is to just put a splash of cold tap water or filtered water, uh, preferably. So that's just uh, maybe like an ounce into the cup first. Then when you add your boiling water, it's going to reduce the overall temperature so that it's perfect for green tea. So this tea, if we notice also on the back says it takes four minutes um, to steep. I don't think I mentioned to grab a timer, but I'm gonna set mine. So when mine goes off, your tea should be ready too. I'm gonna set the timer for four minutes and then um, I'm gonna just change camera angles because I wanted to show you a couple of things I'm gonna, uh, about tea and tea bags. Um, let me do this. Oh, that's just a logo, whoops, sorry about that. Um, trying to share this. Sorry, here we go. So Camellia sinensis is um, the species of plant that all tea comes from. White tea, green tea, oolong, black, poor, yellow. There are uh, six major varieties of tea. They all come from the same species of plant. So what makes the teas different will be uh, where they grow, the, the variety or, or varietal or type of tea plant that they come from, and probably the most important um, factor will be the processing of the leaves. So I'm gonna be showing you a little bit about uh, tea processing, but first um, I just wanna show you the plant in general. So the Camellia sinensis is just an evergreen shrub. Um, it comes in different shapes and sizes because there are different varieties of this plant. Um, but what, what, mem, what we specialize in or what we import typically is called specialty tea or orthodox tea. This is tea that's been handpicked and processed or processed using equipment that mimics hand motions. And it only accounts for three or 4% of all the teas that are produced in the world. Most of the teas that are produced in the world are machine harvested. Um, so this is the pearls we're steeping. That was my cue to say steep the tea because um, anyway, uh, so machine harvesting. So what we want, the hand picking is really taking the new growth of the tea plant. Um, and that's sometimes referred to as orange peco or orange pico, which you might've seen this word before on a tea bag or a, or a tin of tea. Um, it's not really referring to orange flavoring, but rather the House of Orange in Holland, which was one of the first um, uh, groups of people of royalty to import this, this, this part of the tea plant or the, the good stuff I'm gonna refer to that as. So orange pico or orange peco um, is referring to the new growth of the tea plant. So um, these, these older tea leaves are a little bit tougher, um, but they are made into tea. It's just um, not as complex um, as the new growth. So this is tea that's been, it, uh, this is tea that's getting processed for tea bags. So this is 
not just those three new leaves, but all the lower leaves on the plant and the stem and the branches um, gets all chopped up so that you can't really tell what it is uh, once it's in a tea bag. So you might be wondering, this is again, just some of the processing of tea bag tea, which is called CTC or crushed hair curl. Another, another form of tea that goes into tea bags is this is OP or orange peco whole leaf tea being produced, but these are strainers. And so they're sifting of varying sizes. And so they're sifting all of the dried leaves because some of them break. And you can see there's whole leaf tea. Okay, that's my cue that my pearls are ready. So now we can sip on this while, while I continue to I'm almost done with these pictures here. But anyway, you can see the whole leaf tea, you can see the, the broken leaves, and you can see what is sometimes referred to as fannings or dust. And that's the stuff that usually goes into tea bags because it, it's, a, it's got a smaller um, particle size, it's got more surface area, and it's gonna steep quickly in the water. So when you dunk a tea bag, into tea, typically the water will turn brown instantly because of, there's so much dust and small particles in the tea. Um, and these are some of the some of the bits. This was at the tea factory in Darjeeling, uh, where the manager was just showing me examples of the particle sizes um, that they're going to use. So there's OP, which means whole leaf, and then BOP means broken orange peco. And we actually do buy broken teas. We use uh, the broken teas to make blends of chai, um, things that we want to be, to be extra strong. Um, so you may be asking me, Sue Ann, what, you, you have to this, this tea was in a tea bag. What's the deal? Uh, so you're making it sound like tea bag tea is no good. Um, tea bag tea is only as good as what's inside. So let's just see what's inside uh, some tea bags. I, I just grabbed a couple from some friends because I don't have very many of these things at home. <laughs> I don't need them. But this is the land. I'm sorry, could you actually stop scaring, sharing your screen so we can see your other side a little bigger? Oh yeah, of course. Yep, good, good call. Okay, is that good? Perfect, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So you can see, you know, it's just a lot of small bits and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's probably a good thing because that means that that tea is going to um, make a strong infusion. You know, the smaller the bits, um, the stronger the tea. But what we can't tell because it's all chopped up is whether that tea came from uh, new leaves, old leaves, or stems, it, it, it's impossible to tell because of the, you know, it's because of the visual. Um, so what I wanted to just show you is, you know, this is what this is what we put in the jasmine pearl tea bags. These are uh, hand rolled green pearls of tea. It's the same tea that we sell whole leaf that, that goes into our, our tea sachets. So um, when these, after these things steep, I steeped some earlier so that you can see, um, you know, you can see what part of the plant is in here. And this little pointed leaf um, is called a bud or a tip. And that tea uh, leaf usually looks white or silver um, when the tea leaf dries. And so that is um, definitely the most prized part of the plant. The plant puts all of its energy into the new growth. So the newest baby leaf is always going to have the highest concentration of flavor and aromatics and also things like polyphenols, catechins, everything that's good in tea, um, even caffeine everything that's in tea gets concentrated in that little uh, little baby leaf there. So um, the, the neat thing about the pearls is that every, every pearl is, is 
has has three leaves in it has these three leaves in it and that's why it's really the highest grade of uh jasmine tea that that you that you can get um so i think that's all i wanted to show you about that unless you have any any questions there um, so we want to invite you to put your questions in the chat at any time. I'm happy to read them out to Sue Ann as they come up or during breaks. Um, I'd love to ask you, so this is kind of a, uh, I'm cheating a little bit because uh, before we started our program, I mentioned this is my favorite kind of tea, um, literally my favorite tea. Uh, so what are your thoughts on sugar in this type of tea, sugar or honey? If it, if it gets you to drink more tea, I say go for it. <laughs> Um, do you put sugar in it? Um, is, is everyone finding it? I, I would, I always recommend tasting it by itself before you, you know, before you add your, your condiments, you know, just so you know, you know, the flavor, but then if you want to put sugar in it, I say, yeah, more power. We don't judge here at them. I had a customer tonight who said, was buying oolong tea, which is is a, a, a type of tea that's in between green tea and black tea. So black tea are, is usually uh, what you would put milk in. And green tea, you typically would never put milk in green tea, except for matcha. Um, and that's kind of an American thing that we, or, you know, Western thing that we started recently. But oolong tea, I would also not think to put milk and sugar in, but this customer said, I do it all the time. And, and, you know, I had to, I had to contain myself. <laughs> I had to contain my surprise because I, you know, I've never heard of anyone doing that. And then once I thought it through, I'm like, oh, actually you can get oolong at the bubble tea place. So, and I have tried that before. So, okay, I'm, I'm with you. So sometimes it just takes me a minute, you know, to realize that this is your tea, it's not my tea. You can do whatever you want to make it good. Um, so if you're curious a little bit about how the jasmine's produced, I thought while we were sipping on it, I could just show you a few more pictures. As long as there aren't any more questions, I'm gonna go back to sharing if that's okay. So, you know, we saw from the steeped leaves that this is actually what went into that product. Um, this bud or tip of the plant um, is covered in these, it's basically an, an undeveloped leaf. It, it's a leaf that hasn't unfurled yet. And so what this is, is actually the backside of the leaf. And it's covered with these tiny downy white hairs called trichomes. And what they do is they um, basically provide the leaf with the nutrients, the oxygen and the water from the air so that it can grow and thrive. Um, but like I said, when it dries, they remain white or silver. And so if you were to look closely at those, each pearl would have a little white striation through it. And that is, uh, due to this white silver tip. So this tea, and all tea begins with the picking and then the leaves, because it's an evergreen leaf, it's kind of tough, uh, you know, kind of firm. So uh, the leaves will be laid out to wither. This is the first step of tea processing is withering and usually outside in the sunshine, but sometimes inside in the factory, depending on where you are. Um, uh, in, in the world. Uh, so in China, a lot of withering happens outside. And what ha what's happening now is the leaf is losing moisture. So it's becoming limp and pliable. And this would happen to any plant. Uh, you know, you might pick some herb from the garden and notice after a few hours, it gets kind of flimsy. And that's what's happening here with the, the tea leaves. So this is a very important step for green tea is, is the heating uh, this happens after they're withered, they get heated. And what that does is it kills the enzymes that cause oxidation or make a leaf turn brown. So if we had left those leaves out indefinitely in the, in the outside or even out in your kitchen, they eventually turn brown and that's how black tea is produced. So green tea 
is heated and that prevents the leaf from browning. So technically we could take these same leaves if we didn't heat them, they'd turn into black tea or oolong tea. So the heating keeps the leaf green. And then the next thing that happens is the leaves get shaped. And um, these pearls are shaped by hand. Uh, so so this, this, for this particular tea, uh, these pearls, um, that they're gonna um, just take, take a, the bit of stem like we saw, the stem and the three leaves and roll those up into a tiny little pearl. And then they will be dried and then they get scented. So this is a jasmine scented tea. So after they're produced, um, they get uh, blended with jasmine flowers. And the jasmine flowers, this happens in the evening, the jasmine flowers are blended, mixed together with the tea. And in the evening, they open up and they emit their scent onto the tea and then they're removed. So that's typically done four to five times uh, with jasmine to get the, enough flavor so that you can actually taste it in the cup. The result is pretty smooth and soft and sweet. Uh, so we like that. So that reminds me, that was a picture of uh, some Moroccan uh, mint tea. So I thought, I don't know if you've finished your green tea and, and you don't have to drink all, all four teas tonight, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. So I'm gonna start steeping the next tea, uh, which is another green tea called Moroccan mint. It has the same lower tea, lower water temperature, 185 degrees, but three minutes. So a lot of people get confused. So uh, I guess I should mention, so not only, not only is this tea bag have whole leaf tea in it, but you can see it's got a little more room for the tea to float around. Uh, you know, we, we, we put them in these sachets, which are uh, made from a soy-based material. So there's no plastic here. This is just a vegetable uh, matter, um, compostable, biodegradable, even soy ink on the, on, the, on the tag. You know, there's been a lot of concern and do concern. Uh, Anyway, so I'm putting the splash of cold water because I have boiling. And then adding the hot and that cools the overall temperature so that it's close to 185, 170 to 175 degrees. So the reason being for cooler water, for green tea, a lot of people come in and say, I don't like green tea or it doesn't agree with me or I find it bitter or um, sour, you know, they have a lot of negative uh, connotations with green tea. Um, and sometimes it could be because the tea hasn't been brewed properly. So if you don't use cooler water with green tea, then you're extracting more of the bitter components. All tea has bitter components in it. Um, <clears throat> And green tea has more than black tea. And what those bitter components are is caffeine is bitter. And so are the polyphenols or the, anti the antioxidants in green tea. So, or catechins they're called. Um, so the catechins are more concentrated in green tea than black tea. That's why a lot of folks think green tea is good for you. Drink green tea and you know, you'll, you know, you'll feel better and you'll, you'll be more healthy. Um, and there's some truth to that scientifically or chemically, because the, when the plant is in its green form, it has more bitter polyphenols than it does after it turns brown. Um, so once the tea leaf turns brown and turns into black tea, those catechins or polyphenols actually change chemically and they turn into um, theobromide and theorubogens, which are more kind of have different benefits for you. It's a different kind of stimulant. It's good for your um, circulatory system and your, uh, your, your blood vessels. And so some doctors will say green tea is good for your immunity and black tea is good for um, blood pressure, cholesterol, that sort of stuff, because they're, they're different. Anyway, so the lower 
those catechins and the caffeine are water soluble. So if you use lower temperature and less time, you're gonna get less bitterness in the tea or astringency we like to call it. Uh, Cause those catechins have tannin and that's the same st substance that's in the skin of a grape. It makes wine dry. If you ever had a dry glass of uh, red or white wine, you know that it kind of takes the moisture from your mouth and that's what can happen with tea as well. A little bit of tannin is desirable because without tannin in wine, you'd be drinking juice. And without tannin in tea, it would be kind of flat and one dimensional. So the, um, the guidelines that we put on the package are let it steep until the tannin just starts to begin or begins to appear and then take the bag out so that you don't continue to develop um, So I see a question coming in, but I uh, didn't catch the whole thing. All right, I was getting my uh, tea bag out of my tea. <laughs> um, you yeah, know, room in the sachet is better for tea bags. Is brewing, if brewing loose tea, is it better to have a strainer with more room than one of those metal ball loose tea brewers? Good question. Uh, yes, as you can see, and you might notice this in with your own tea bag that it's pretty full. Um, and room is important. If you don't have enough room, like those pearls, if you don't have enough room for those to open up and expand, then there's flavor inside that never gets developed. So with loose tea, the more room that it has to float around, or sometimes they refer to that as the agony of the leaves, um, the more room for, for all the surface area to be in contact with water, the better. So. Tea balls, depending on, if you if you do use a tea ball, get the biggest one you possibly can, so that there's room in there, uh, you know, for the tea to float around and expand, because those leaves will expand. Um, we don't have any. We don't sell tea balls because it's tough. Uh, you know, it, what we actually like to use is a strainer that just sits in your mug. Um, you know that's open, but whatever works, we don't judge. You wanna use a tea ball? By all means, it makes tea from whole leaves. That's excellent. Um, so I'm guessing everyone has their Moroccan mint steeped now. So this is kind of a funny blend. Uh, there are many tea companies that make Moroccan mint tea. Most of them are not Moroccan or mint. Uh, you know, so Moroccan mint is a blend of green gunpowder tea and, and mint that originated in Morocco. Uh, so it's always green tea gunpowder from China um, because that's the first tea that was exported to Morocco from China. Um, and and gunpowder tea, I'll show you a picture of it, uh, is, is rolled into these tiny little pellets, not by hand like the pearls, it's a little kind of messier looking tea. Um, so I'm gonna again share, sorry for the... Uh, so in Morocco, they would be getting the gunpowder green tea brewing it in this teapot pretty strong putting you know quite a bit of tea leaves in here and also boiling water so this so the tea would get that bitterness that astringency that strength um, and that's what all the sugar's for <laughs> so if your green tea comes out bitter if you put some nice fresh mint that the uh, the mint is abundant in morocco sold on every street corner um, and anytime someone's making tea in Morocco, they're gonna put some fresh mint in there and a fair amount of sugar to kill that bitter flavor that happens from the tea. Um, it's, so here we go, you can have a better look at gunpowder tea. So this tea does get processed like the, like the jasmine, with, except 
these aren't rolled by hand. There's actually a machine. Um, most of our teas are machine processed, but not machine picked. And that's the big difference is, is that this machine can roll the tea almost as well as a person, but make it affordable. You know, if this tea was hand rolled, um, we, we, it, we would be out probably out of reach. So, so the tea goes into this chamber and then this thing just kind of twirls around and around and there are these fins on the bottom. And eventually with enough pressure and circulation, you get the shapes of the tea leaves. So a lot of people wonder why shape the tea leaf? What's, what's the purpose of that, you know? And originally, um, I think it was to compress the tea and make it more compact for ease of transport. Um, but over time, this is just the tea being prepared. Um, over time, um, and, and of thousands of years of making tea from, from, the, from the dehydrated leaves, it became clear that by rolling the tea or shaping the tea, what it does is that's what that step does is it breaks the cell structure of the leaf so that the tea oils that are inside the interior of the leaf begin to um, coat the outside of the leaf and that makes them more accessible to water. So um, by it's sort of like wringing out a towel, you're gonna start to get um, some tea oil on the surface of the leaf and then roll it and tuck it back inside um, and then dry it so that those flavors and aromatics are preserved um, for, because um, we're gonna be drinking this tea for, for the next 12 months. You know, tea is produced in the spring and the summer. And then like right now, no one's making tea. So we have to wait until April before new tea gets produced. So, so that rolling and shaping and dehydrating is a way of preserving the tea and making it flavorful months later in the cup. Um, so this is just a sort of a traditional method of making rock and mint tea. The, you know, the taller, the, the longer, the poor, sort of the more um, um, dramatic, you know, the, the presentation, um, the better. And usually they'll, get a little bit of froth on top of when, you know, when, when pouring it from that distance, you get a little froth on top. Um, and that's supposed to get rid of the toxins in the tea or that bitterness that came from basically brewing it too, too, too long. Uh, but the sugar takes care of that. So um, tea in M most cultures, you anyone that invites you into their home into their home is going to start to prepare some sort of tea for you. Um, it's hard to escape going anywhere without getting a cup of tea. I was going to move on to black tea, I guess. Um, but let me just go. Well, I'd love to ask a question before we do that and, and open up uh, the floor for any questions about Minty, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's a good idea. So uh, I don't want to jump too far ahead and get too far into herbal teas, but I know that a lot of mint teas advocate as n being non-caffeinated or uncaffeinated. So I assume in that case, they wouldn't be using the Camellia sinensis plant. Is that correct? Right, right. So Moroccan mint, that's that's the, the tricky, confusing part about this blend is that it's always got green tea in it. So it's always caffeinated, but it's a mixture of Camellia sinensis and, and mint leaves together. Whereas we do have something called Mediterranean mint, which is just the mint, which would be caffeine free. So when you put those two things together, you get less caffeine than if you just drank green tea, but it's not caffeine free. So um, some of our blends have tea and botanicals in them and, and the herbs are all free of caffeine, but then you get a little bit of caffeine from the green tea. In general, um, green tea has less caffeine than black tea. Uh, a cup of black tea 
it's going to have about 50 milligrams of caffeine, which is about half of a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee typically has about 100. A cup of black tea is going to have about 50. And then green tea, less than that, maybe more like 30, 30 milligrams, 25. And then if you mix that with mint, that's going to cut that in half. So now we're talking about 17, maybe, you know, 15 to 17 milligrams in the, in the Moroccan mint tea. My husband just said, that's not bad and took a big old slug because he was worried about tea too late at night. So he's enthused to go ahead and drink some more. Good, good. <laughs> I was going to say with the froth on the top, we do the same thing with Cuban coffee. With the coffee, you make a, like a big, kind of like a Italian espresso. You make the big froth on the top. And, and do you feel like that that's releasing some toxin or is it just for presentation? It's, it's for the flavor, well, presentation, but also for the sugar, for the flavor, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a fan of Cuban coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say that often on live TV, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about the, um, the green teas or mint tea specifically in the chat before we move on to black tea? everybody just a hot second to type oh yes excellent what are the measurements for loose jasmine pearls and mint teas if the tea was loose uh you would need one teaspoon per cup so so like here's a teaspoon yeah so if i were making if i were making a cup um i would just take from the from the loose leaf tea I don't know if you can see just one level teaspoon, um, which we would um, also put on the packaging. But um, the industry standard for, for tea is by weight. So it's 2.5 grams per cup or per eight ounce serving. Um, follow up question. We just have somebody saying, good question. I've been using too much. I, and I, when I drink tea, I tend to drink from obscenely large tea mugs. So when you say cup, do you mean cup or do you mean like cup measure or do you mean I mean large size ounce. tea mug? <laughs> yeah, so I mean eight ounce cup. Eight ounces, um, okay. Uh, so if you have a large, right, whose cup is eight ounces anymore? <laughs> Not so much. Um, so if you have a big mug, you might need, a, you know, you might, Rather than one level teaspoon, you might want to put in a heaping teaspoon, you know, for 12 ounces or two teaspoons for a 16 ounce mug. Uh, what I do also, which, you know, growing up, it was frowned upon and, and still is, depending on the tea bag, is to use it again. <laughs> right. So you just had that exact question in the chat. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> Um, so with this stuff, yeah, use it again, for sure. This is, uh, these are, you know, the, the gunpowder, you saw how it was so tightly rolled up and also the pearls, um, tightly rolled leaves that um, maybe after the three minutes aren't fully open. So this, that means that that interior still has flavor left. And so I always um, steep my tea three times. I don't know why, you know, it's kind of just, I don't know if it's superstition or what, but um, usually if I'm having a, except for black tea, uh, you know, like an Earl Grey or an English breakfast or any tea that I have in the morning with, I, I usually put milk in, in my tea in the morning, that's one and done. But if I'm having a green tea or a new long or even an herbal tea, um, I will re-steep those leaves. They do, it gets a little bit weaker as you go. Sometimes, sometimes it gets stronger because then the leaf is finally getting, you know, the first, the first steep, you're just really just wetting the outside of the leaf. And then the second steep gets more flavor because the leaf has opened up and has more to give, you know, more surface area. Um, so I would, yeah, I would highly recommend steeping the tea again. Um, but you know, at home, I, I, my father used to steep his tea and then I'd see these things sitting on, you know, on the saucer. 
And I would always throw them away <laughs> on him and say, you know what, just open a new one. This is like, you know, five cents, just open a new one. You won't regret it. So, um, but with these tea bags, you could certainly, I would, I would definitely, you know, in, in fact, cause it's late, I'm just keep. I have this little wick bucket here where I'm just storing those, but as long as they're not sitting in water, you know, you could put this on a saucer and put it in the fridge and then make, make it again tomorrow. I'd recommend try it. I don't, you know, I haven't done it with a, with a tea bag. Uh, I don't really, you know, I have loose leaf tea at my disposal here. So I don't always experiment with the tea bags, but um, I know that there's a lot of tea in there. We, you know, the, the industry standard is 2.5 grams, but we, uh, we try to get as much tea as we can in there. And the machine that makes tea bags can go up to 3.5 grams. And that's what we try to do so that this tea bag is not only good for an eight ounce cup, but good for a 16 ounce cup, even a 20 ounce cup. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, let's go ahead and move to black tea because I don't want to take up too much of your time tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I always tend to, yeah, take too long. Um, okay, so I'm just going to show you a quick run. Let's, first of all, before we might as well steep this because this one's going to take four minutes. So this says 212 degree water, which is boiling. It's fine if your water is not at a rolling boil. In fact, I like to wait until it's, you know, calmed down a little bit so you don't scald yourself. But uh, I think I saw Lara's sniffing this <laughs> it's it's fragrant this is the blue flower earl gray we're going to make next um and so what i was going to do with this one is steep it in eight ounces of water taste it black and then make a latte or a london fog with 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 the steeped tea you don't have to do that but i'm just going to show you how that how that would work so if you if you if you plan on making a latte or a, a London fog, I'm gonna steep the tea for four minutes. Um, you can also, put some milk, uh, a little bit of milk for four to six ounces of milk in, either in the heat it in the, either in the microwave or on the stove, just warm up a little bit of milk because we're gonna be adding that to the Earl Grey once it's steeped. Question in the chat, if you use 205 degree water instead of 212 for black tea, would it be less bitter? I haven't noticed that much of a difference between those temperatures, but yes, technically, technically I would say, yes, that's possible. That the 212 boiling water could scald the tea, could, um, will definitely extract more of the tannin faster. That's, that's a fact. Um, so uh, I guess maybe that's why the English always say off the boil, you know, like boil the water, then let it rest and then make your tea off the boil. So you're not putting scalding water on the tea leaves. I think it's a good idea. Okay, so I just wanna show you real quickly how this black tea gets produced. Um, we learned most of our black tea is either from China, um, India, or Sri Lanka. Um, and black tea is sometimes named after the region or the place where the tea grows. So some of our teas, especially in tea bag form, say English breakfast. Um, what that is though really is a single origin tea from Sri Lanka. It's a Ceylon black tea, it's not a blend, but other tea companies make English breakfast blends where it could be some tea from Sri Lanka, some tea from Assam, which is another growing region in India, or Darjeeling, which is this teeny tiny little area here. Um, but what we're drinking is our blue flower Earl Grey, and that is from 
Sri Lanka. So Ceylon is the old fashioned name for Sri Lanka and it's the fourth largest tea producer in the world, even though it's a 10th of the size of India. Um, and that's because tea can grow year round here. So um, they have some microclimates in this region where tea, there's no, no frost uh, or no snow. So um, they get tea production year round. So not only is the whole region really um, populated with black tea plants, um, but also it's being produced more often than it is in other places. So um, this is where our Earl Grey comes from, the candy region of Sri Lanka. Um, and then I'm just gonna show you quickly how this tea would get produced. S still all picked by hand um, and then left. So, so what happens with the black tea um, in Sri Lanka and India is all the tea gets produced in the factory. So the tea is withering inside the factory on the upper level. So that ha that's gonna be left overnight to wither, which just means getting limp. Then it gets rolled and here's a sort of industrial size rolling machine. And what that's gonna do is, so this tea has not been heated. So this is still gonna just, just the leaf from the withering stage goes through this rolling machine, which is gonna start to bruise the leaf and wring out those tea oils and get them uh, again, then shape the leaves. And then after rolling, uh, the leaves get laid out on these tables uh, to brown. So when it comes out of the rolling machine, it looks green and then they just lay it down <clears throat> and wait for it to turn brown, which really only takes a few hours. Once the leaves are fully oxidized or brown, then they go into the oven. This is a convection oven that's gonna dehydrate the leaf and make it shelf stable. So once 97% or 98% of the water is removed from the tea leaf, then it's gonna hopefully be good for the next calendar year. Usually all the tea that was picked and processed in one day will stay together. So these slips of paper will have a number on them and that's the number of the day that the tea was picked. So that way, when we wanna buy tea, um, we ask for a sample if we can't visit, if we can't visit the factory, which has been the truth for the past three years, we haven't been visiting anybody, um, we get samples in the mail of this, which might be you know number 35. And if we like it, then we say, we'll take the whole thing. And so all this tea will be kept together as a lot. And, and we know that this bucket should taste the same as this one. They should all taste the same because they were all made on the same day from the same raw material. So that's a bit about processing black tea. We're having Earl Grey, which has got a lot of stories about how it was produced and why. Um, supposedly it was made for this guy, prime minister in 1860 from the ambassador of China. And what made it, <clears throat> what makes it give it this nice fragrance is bergamot oil. So bergamot is a Mediterranean citrus. It's a bitter orange. The fruit is practically inedible, but the rind is used to make bergamot oil, which is used to make flavor Earl Grey tea. Uh, it's also used in a lot of aromatherapy products because it has a calming, soothing effect um, on people, which is why it's our most popular tea. And actually it's the most popular, most popular tea in the Western world is Earl Grey. <clears throat> um, it's often drunk at afternoon tea. <laughs> so I'd bring up a little bit of uh, a little bit of you know tidbits here. Uh, this <clears throat> this young lady, the Duchess of Bedford, sort of started afternoon tea as we know it because <clears throat> the dinner hour kept getting later and later in the day. You know, it used to be they used to be having. Uh, dinner at four or five in, in the evening, and then it started getting six, seven, eight o'clock at night. And she she wanted to have some sustenance in the afternoon to you know to stop that sinking feeling. So she 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 ordered tea and some biscuits to be brought to her room, 
And then eventually she started inviting other ladies from the court to have tea and scones and whatnot with her. And then it became a thing. So afternoon tea uh, was uh, served ever since. But what's funny is sometimes we call it high tea, but they called it low tea because they would be sitting on the couch <laughs> having tea instead of at the kitchen table, which would be high tea. So high tea was actually for the commoners who were actually having a main, main meal. They would have tea with their supper, which was at the kitchen table and it was often meat and potatoes. Uh, sitting at, high, at a high table would be high tea and low tea would be in the living room on a couch or a duvet, duvet or divan, whatever these, whatever these things are, um, having tea on a low table. So, uh, but nowadays we just call it high tea or afternoon tea, one in the same. So this black tea could be drunk as it is, not bad, has kind of a natural sweetness to it. You could, or you could add sugar, or we could add milk and sugar uh, to make a London fog. Um, there is also sort of a, people have disagreements about, do you put the milk in the tea or the tea in the milk? Um, and typically I would say in England, you would want to either put the, put the milk in your cup first in a heated cup too. So if you put the milk in the cup first and the, and the cup is warm, then your milk will be warmer than if you just put cold milk over hot tea. So I actually learned while I was in England that it was a status mark to where if you had China that was able to withstand the high temperatures of boiling water directly, you would be able to add your milk after you had already poured the water. But if you were had lower grade China, you would have to pour your milk first so your China wouldn't crack when you added your hot water. Wow, uh, okay, you taught me something. I had no <laughs> idea. I think it was bone China. I see, okay, well that makes perfect sense then. And why, why there's you know this discrepancy with one person doing it one way and, and one person doing it the other. Um, so London Fog, people familiar with this thing? Um, it's kind of a, a, a Western, you know, well, black tea in general is, is a Western um, phenomenon um, because we, we like to put milk in everything, tea, coffee, et cetera. So, and it doesn't work as well with white, with green tea and white tea. So uh, black tea and milk go nicely together. And so um, what I was going to do, I already have some warm milk. Okay, yeah, so London Fogs are wonderful for sure. Um, this was eight ounces of Earl Grey tea. So what I'm going to do is just take some of it, like four, half of it. I guess I could have just kept it in the mug, but I'm going to take half of it and I'm going to add some sugar. For this amount, I'm going with one teaspoon. Going with one teaspoon. I'm sorry, my, my, my computer's not plugged in. So I just saw that I'm, I'll be right back. <laughs> While Sue Ann's grabbing her cable, I'd love to just take a poll in the chat and have you put in your favorite tea of tonight so far, but then also in general. I've already confessed to my favorite tea being uh, the Jasmine Pearls. Does anybody else want to share their favorites in the chat? Sorry about that. So. Lots of votes for Earl Grey. Yeah, 
I'm putting in a quarter teaspoon of um, vanilla extract. So London Fog typically has some vanilla component. If you get by one at a coffee shop or a cafe, they'll they'll have a, a vanilla, you know, pre-made simple syrup. Um, but you can make your own vanilla syrup with a little vanilla extract and some sugar and some hot water. You don't need a whole lot of vanilla, you know, a couple drops. Um, the the fog is a little bit different from just tea and milk because it has a fair amount of milk. Um, so usually about 50-50. So I heated this milk earlier um, on the frother. So I would, I would just do, you know, something like that. So it's really milky, you know, and, and uh, kind of light in color. But, you know, if you had Earl Grey and you just added some milk to your cup, to your cup, I think it would be more, you know, more tea forward. Whereas this is kind of more like a milky latte, you know, almost like cafe latte in the coffee world is latte means milk. So it's a milky coffee. So this is a milky tea, uh, the fog, more like a tea latte. So it is almost eight o'clock, um, but I don't know how many of you are actually going to be able to do this at home, but um, if you see it's easy, you could do it, you know, we have more time and, and plus it is eight o'clock at night, so you might not want all the caffeine. But it's a pretty tasty treat. Got a question. What are some good quality tea brands that we can find or purchase at local or general supermarkets? That's a good question. I don't always purchase. I, I would say anything that ha, that that's whole leaf would be where I would start. You know, um, like Rishi is a is a national brand. Um, you know, from from the West Coast that is sold at least in Whole Foods, if not even in every market. I'm not sure, but. Um, you know, there's some, there's some English brand, you know, Harney has whole leaf tea. Um, as long as you can see, you know, as long as you can see that, oh, it's, there's, I, these are tea leaves, you know, this is not just some ground up powder that I can't, you know, decipher what, you know, what it, what it really is. Um, I don't know that the brand always matters, but, um, you know, we do, um, we do taste a lot of teas from uh, from origin. You know, when when we when we buy tea to make Earl Grey, we get the tea first from Ceylon, and we try. We usually taste at least six or seven before we choose the one that we want to be our Earl Grey. So even holy all whole leaf tea is not equal, um, but. That's my advice, aside from, you know, if you, we, we're not in supermarkets, so. Um, are you familiar with teas from any American estates and how do they compare to the imported teas? There's one estate in uh, North Carolina, um, I, North or South, I can't remember, um, that makes black tea. Um, it's okay. I would say that, you know, because we, you know, in, in, we're like a hundred years later than a couple hundred years later than, uh, India and a couple thousand years later than China. It's in Charleston. Yes. Um, so tea can grow in the South. In the American South, because you know, if there's no frost or, or snow, um, but there also are tea um, plantations starting up in um, California and Oregon and Hawaii, 
and there's even one in Michigan, but they have their plants are in greenhouses because of the threat of frost. So they're trying to develop plants that can withstand frost. That's the only way we would be able to grow more tea in the United States. Um, but I would say that American tea pales in comparison to, um, to the tea that we import. The only thing that we get here, we don't get anything from America. <laughs> we get peppermint, you know, we get mint, herbs, some herbs, but not even very many of them. Oregon produces some nice peppermint. Um, and we have a farm in Maine where we grow a little bit of our own peppermint, uh, not peppermint, but mint. Um, so I was gonna make ginger lemon tea next, but... Um, we don't have a hard stop time. We just wanna be respectful of your time and everybody else here. So whatever okay. you would like to do. Okay, all right, yeah, I'll do it. Um, any more, oh, I saw... Yeah, we have a question about your location in Watertown. Is your warehouse still in Watertown? And oh. they went there in the early days with your retail and they love your Davis Square shop too. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. So so this, uh, our Davis Square store opened in 2016. <laughs> nope, <laughs> no advice for staining the teeth. Uh, my dentist says you should get more cleanings, but... I'm only allowed two, so they just have to clean them harder. Uh, black tea will stain your teeth. Green tea, oolong, not as much. So you can always try to lean towards uh, teas that are, uh, you know, not as colorful. But um, it's the price we pay. <laughs> We've also um, got a request for a recommendation. They're experimenting with loose oolongs. Can you recommend one of yours that's more light and golden and less dark roasted? Um, yeah, so um, the, our greener oolongs, we have one called jade oolong, which is very floral, uh, yellow, kind of gold in the cup and nice and nice and floral and fruity. Um, we also have one called golden buds milk oolong, which is um, kind of buttery. Um, it's not for everyone, but people say it kind of tastes, smells like buttered popcorn and, but it's still light in the cup. So it's gold in the cup. That has a really creamy, they call it milk oolong because it has a nice texture to it. Okay, you're very welcome. I saw that. What about uh, Lapsan Sushan? I think that's how you say it. Yeah. I love that tea. You like that tea? Yeah. That's yeah it's, a it's very smoky. It's very like, it has a, a very specific flavor. It's, yep. do you guys carry, do you guys carry one of those? Yeah, actually, we have a couple of them. Um, what we always have one, and then sometimes if we if we find a second, like we have sort of two grades, you know, there's like the everyday lapsang, and then there's the fancy one. And the only difference, you know, if if you remember that first picture of the different leaves on the plant as it went lower, there's one called Sushong, and that was a big mature leaf. That's because they don't want to take those itty bitty little baby leaves and smoke them because then you would lose, you know, the complexity of their character. You need the, the, the more mature leaf. Uh, so that's what Lapsang means smoked and Sushong is referring to the, the lower leaves on the, on the tea branch that they would use to make that product. Um, and it smells like a campfire in a cup for sure. Well, I really couldn't, I, I mean, we have so many herbal teas and I just picked one because this is what I, in the tea bag selection, this is what, what I like to drink at night, ginger lemon tea. Um, and I started drinking it recently because I had a sore throat. It wasn't COVID related. It wasn't, I don't know why. I, I think it was just from talking too much, <laughs> which can happen. Um, so I had a sore throat and I'm like, well, I always tell our customers to drink ginger lemon tea because it's good, it's good for coughs, colds, et cetera. So this is a blend of dried ginger, lemongrass and linden flower. All herbal teas can take boiling water. You don't have to worry about 
scalding it or getting too much tannin because there's no tannin in any of these herbs. So there's no caffeine in these and there's no tannin in, uh, in herbal tea. Um, and actually Mark uh, Meradian, um, before he started the tea company, he spent a lot of time in Armenia and, and Greece and, and a lot of places where we get up most of our herbs from. Uh, Greece especially is where we buy all of our linden from. It's where we get our Mediterranean mint for the Moroccan mint tea. And, um, and also um, we get something called Mount Olympus flowers, which is a Greek mountain flower uh, from Greece. Um, and so he's the one that actually has the farm in Maine where he produces some of his own herbal teas. I would say at least four minutes, but the nice thing that you, uh, for, for, this, for this tea, but the nice thing is that if I forget about it, I'm not setting a timer because if I forget about it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't get astringent um, because it doesn't have any Camellia sinensis in it. So um, anyway, so I started, drinking this tea, you know, cause I wanted it to soothe my throat. And then it, it turned out, <clears throat> well, I also had a, had a class um, with spirits of hot toddies. And so if you put a little bit of honey and lemon in here, you know, and a cinnamon stick, um, it gets even better. You know, the honey kind of soothes the throat. So, it's hard once you've been making it like with the honey and the lemon, you know, then it's, it's great just by itself. So ginger is good. Uh, you know, it's always been used in Chinese medicine for, you know, thousands of years. Um, lemongrass is good for inflammation in the nose and the throat. Good for, uh, you know, reducing inflammation, has a lot of antioxidants. Um, and so does linden flower. Linden, linden is a deciduous tree. We have them, you know, around here in Boston, but it's the European linden that they make tea from. It looks like a maple tree and it has these little helicopters that land, you know, that drop the seed to the ground. And that's what the tea is produced from. So the linden flower has uh, almost a honey-like flavor to it. So, you know, if you wanted to be a purist and just drink this ginger lemon tea by itself, it does have a natural sweetness from the linden um, and the, um, and, the, and the, the bright, you know, citrus note from the lemongrass. But if you wanted to enhance those with, you know, honey and lemon, um, you'd have a real, uh, a real soother. Um, so herbs have been drunk way before tea was even invented. People have been drinking herbs uh, for medicinal reasons for 9,000 years. It started in China and also in India um, some of the old old Vedic Sanskrit books, uh, you know, talk about drinking herbs for health. Um, and that's the Ayurvedic medicine, beginnings of Ayurvedic medicine uh, would be make, you know, drink these things um, uh, for health reasons. Um, and in India, um, in, in many countries, in, in Greece, they'd have these, you know, these herbs simmering on the stove um, and every household would have their own sort of home remedy, you know, of herbs and plants, either from the garden or, you know, from just going out and foraging um, and just have this stuff simmering uh, to drink, you know, for, for health reasons and nutritional reasons. It's actually how chai came to be, um, you know, all the spices in chai, the masala spices, cardamom, cinnamon, clove, ginger, these were all things that went into these home brews that, uh, you know, the grandmother in India would be, you know, keep warm on the stove and drink um, for health reasons. And then eventually tea and milk and sugar got added, uh, you know, to, to make it more palatable and also to add nutritional value. Um, so, Chai was kind of, Chai's beginnings was, was really an herbal home remedy. So after four minutes, you know, I'm getting, uh, you know, some nice kind of bite from the ginger. We always, we use a lot of ginger. In fact, you know, just to get a sense of, you know, we, so, you know, we sell to a lot of restaurants and cafes around, around the city and also some other states. Um, you know, like Earl Grey, for instance, we, you know, we need to buy probably 
20,000 pounds of this tea. So um, <clears throat> in chai, the same thing, in English breakfast, the same thing. And so it's hard to get 20,000 pounds that are gonna taste the same, you know, over a full calendar year because no one produces that much tea in one day. So we wind up getting what they call a standard. So when we when we buy our tea from Sri Lanka, we get that we get that one day's you know production and the tea maker will say we'll make this tea like this next time. And so that's why the tea does vary a little bit uh, from month I wouldn't say from month to month, you know, but it can vary, you know, depending on the lot and when it was purchased. And uh, so we never, you know, we never, we never, we're never able to buy just one Earl Grey that's going to last all year. Um, the other thing that is, uh, it was, oh, so the, I brought that up because of the ginger. Ginger gets hotter as, as the season progresses. So the early, the early ginger is very soft and sweet and, and tasty, and then it starts to get hotter and hotter. And so what we have to do is save some of that sweet ginger and blend it together with the hot ginger so that we have a consistent product throughout the year. So that's why we spend so many hours tasting things is because every time we get a new ingredient, we have to make adjustments to our blends. And this one's no different. The ginger is always constantly being tweaked. And, and I don't like super hot things. So I'm always like the litmus test, like can Sue Ann drink it? It's not too hot for her, is it? Okay, we're good. Most of the crew was like, make it hotter, but someone's got to draw the line. Well, thank you so much. I want to open the floor for any last minute questions that anybody has before we go. And while we're giving everybody a chance to type, I'm also going to throw your website into the chat as well as the link again to our evaluation form. We would love to hear what you thought of the program tonight and if you have any ideas for future programs. So let me find that while you all are typing your last questions. Well, I hope you liked the teas and I hope it wasn't too much caffeine for one evening. How about a, a recommendation on storing tea at home? Right, um, so that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> it needs to be in something that is airtight and away from light and hopefully away, you know, it's funny because most people store their tea above the stove where all the smells from the food could go up and make your tea smell like, I don't know, smoked salmon or whatever you're cooking. Um, as long as it's in an airtight container away from light and heat, um, that would be best. Um, so I don't want to disrupt your feng shui of your kitchen. If your tea is above the stove, that's okay. Cause it's dark there. You know, it's not the coolest cupboard in the house. Um, but as long as it's in an airtight container away from light and as much heat as possible, it's fine. Um, yeah, what I was going to say about some, some, so some of these teas are scented, you know, the, the Earl Grey is a flavored oil that was added to the black tea after it was produced. But the jasmine was the flowers gave it its scent. But both of those, if they were open to stored in a container that was not airtight, the tea would still be good, but the aroma would dissipate. So, um, so it's the air that really is, is, is the enemy, you know? Could you talk briefly about different types of matcha? Of matcha. Sure, yeah. So matcha is uh, unique to Japan. It's a, it's a green tea and it's specially processed. So um, it's actually the, the best teas, kind of the same as coffee. You might have, you know, if you're, if you're a coffee person at all, you hear like 
mountain grown, you know, uh, the higher elevations produce better coffee. That's the same for tea. The higher elevations produce better tea because um, it's cooler. Uh, the temperature's cooler. There's less sunshine happening. Also, the early spring teas are also better because there's less sunshine in the day. You know, the days are shorter. So, so what they do to make matcha is um, cover the plants with a big mesh tarp. So the plants are shaded. And, and what that does is it, it deprives them of sunlight and it forces them to produce more chlorophyll. And then they draw, the plants draw more nitrogen from the soil and they, um, they produce more amino acid in the leaf, which gives amino acids in the leaf, um, give the tea a, a, a texture, you know, more texture. So, so the tea is um, kind of brothy. The, the, the result is brothy and kind of has a savory umami kind of flavor uh, because of the extra green um, and the extra protein in the, in the, in the leaf. Um, and so those are the leaves that get ground into a fine powder and made into matcha. The other tea leaves that are not covered, those will get picked and made into sencha, which is tea, leaf tea. So matcha is always shaded for at least three weeks. Um, and the different grades is right, because you can spend, I don't know, you could probably get matcha for five or $6 in the supermarket, um, or you can spend $500 on it. Um, and and the, the difference in that is gonna be the, the, the raw material that it was made from. Did it come from the mountains? Is it was it picked in the spring? Was it picked from just the new leaves of the tea plant, or was it picked from some of the lower leaves? Was it shaded for one week, or two weeks, or three weeks? Um, so all of the factors that make tea good um, are apply to matcha, and um, make. There's also different types of matcha plants. Um, you know, most of the green tea. Uh, most of the sencha green tea um, in Japan is made from a specific kind of tea plant called yabukita. It's a good cultivar, kind of a common cultivar. You wouldn't want to make matcha from that. You would want to make matcha from a different kind. So they've been sort of um, developing the tea plants over all these years for better yield and flavor. And so, you know, one is leaning more towards matcha and the other is going, you know, kind of more towards our American tastes, which are different from the Japanese palate. Well, thank you so much, so much, Sue Ann. We won't keep you any later tonight. We know we've already kept you past your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you so much to MemT for providing our take and make packets so that some of us were able to do a little bit of sipping. Um, I did put your website in the chat. So, um, Check out MEMT and we Great. hope that you enjoyed. Okay, yeah, thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. And just a reminder, this program was recorded tonight. So anybody who was not able to make it, please point them towards our YouTube page where in just a few days, this video will be posted. Great. Thank okay. you again. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.